Hi everyone, my name is Shelby and you're watching Read and Find Out. I don't think that you can hear too much that I was sick in my voice. I don't know, you might be able to. I was sick a couple weeks ago and I still feel like I sound kind of sick. So hopefully it won't be too bad. Happy 2020! Because it is now 2020, I want to bring to you my top 19 books of 2019. But before I do that, I want to give some honorable mentions. So there are like 10 books that I really did love and enjoy that I would still want to recommend that I read in 2019. However, they didn't make it onto my top 19 list. So without further ado, here are the honorable mentions. Becoming by Michelle Obama, Don't Call Us Dead by Denez Smith, Fool's Quest by Robin Hobb, Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World by Ashley Herring Blake, My Grandmother Asked Me to Tell You She's Sorry by Frederick Bachman, Tales from the Inner City by Sean Tan, The Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow, The Testaments by Margaret Atwood, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, and We Should All Be Feminists by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. So those, those did not make my top 19. I still really highly recommend them and would love for you to check them out. Now, I've broken up the top 19 by kind of genre. Really, there's just one nonfiction book and then everything else is fiction broken down by genre because I only had one nonfiction book that made it into the top 19. And that was not that bad, Dispatches from Rape Culture, which was edited by Roxane Gay. This is an anthology of feminist essays and stories by men, women, NB folks, people of color, white people, queer people, straight people, like just I feel like everybody is pretty much represented by this in different aspects of rape culture. There are specific instances that are described of sexual violence, but there are also things like catcalling, sexual harassment, sexual assault, being devalued based on your sex or gender. I don't know, this just did such a good job, I thought, of really getting this whole perspective from a variety of people on rape culture and how that influences our culture. Obviously tread lightly with this one though, if you have triggers, it probably will be in this. Obviously, like I always do, the triggers for the books will be listed in the description below. Now we have the graphic work, and there are three graphic novels that made it onto my top 19 list. The first one is Ascender, Volume 1, The Haunted Galaxy, which is the first volume, obviously, in the Ascender series. The Ascender series being a follow-up to the Descender series, which I read in like 2017, 2018. This is really a crossover of science fiction and fantasy because the Descender series was science fiction. This is leaning more into kind of fantasy as opposed to science fiction, but it still has very strong science fiction elements because in this world, without saying much because of spoilers for Descender, this involves magic and there are still robots and AI and everything, but the world has changed a lot since the Descender series. The art is beautiful as always, and if you liked Descender, I would say you should continue on with this. And if you haven't read Descender, I would recommend it because it's one of my favorite graphic novel series. Then we have Tales from Outer Suburbia by Sean Tan, which is a YA kind of magical realism graphic novel. Though it's kind of YA, I would say that really this appeals to all ages because there's some sort of like darkness and loneliness almost that I feel is represented in these. With this being magical realism, I think that Sean Tan does a really good job of finding the magical or putting the magical into the mundane. I mentioned Tales from the Inner City in my honorable mentions. Tales from Outer Suburbia, I feel like, does a particularly good job. Tales from the Inner City had to do with like animal relationships almost, which was interesting. But this is like everyday suburban life, but there are random bits of magic. I love the art. Sean Tan is one of my favorite graphic novelists now. It's a little bit bleak, but I don't know, there are kind of instances of hope in everything as well. I just really like Sean Tan's work. Definitely pick up Sean Tan, especially if you like whimsy, if things that are whimsical really appeal to you. I don't know, that's something that I think I needed a lot in 2019, was that whimsy. And then the final graphic work, which actually kind of shifts us into the next category, is Stargazing by Jen Wong. I'm sorry, I can't remember if it's Wong or Wang. Jen Wang? I don't know. 
She wrote The Prince and the Dressmaker, which was my favorite 2018 release, and then this was released in 2019, and I didn't like it quite as much as The Prince and the Dressmaker, but it was still so good. This is middle grade contemporary, and it has very strong themes of friendship and loneliness, particularly feeling lonely as a child. There are also some themes regarding illness, as well as enjoying what you enjoy and being your true self, and how friends can bring that out in us. I really enjoy the art and everything. I don't want to show too much because I don't want it to be given away. But this is following a girl named Christine who is part of a Chinese American community and there are these specific expectations placed on her by her parents and some of the community members about who and what she should be, what kind of activities she should be engaged in. And it's not that she doesn't like these things, but she feels like there are other aspects of her that aren't being acknowledged or that she's being denied access to in a sense. And then she meets this girl who comes from a very different background, different but still within the same community. And her name is Moon and she is pretty unapologetically herself. And the friendship that develops between these two and some of the things that happen later in the graphic novel are just so sweet and I feel like they're very important in middle grade in particular. And as someone who works with children, Granted, the oldest children that I work with are fifth graders who are like 11 years old, sometimes 12. But still, these kids felt real to me. Some of the things that happened in their friendship, I was like, I definitely see stuff like that with kids all the time. They just felt fully realized and I appreciated that a lot. This was so sweet. Since that one was middle grade, we'll just go ahead and move into middle grade because there were a couple of other things that were middle grade that I really enjoyed in 2019. The first was Small Spaces by Catherine Arden. Catherine Arden is the author of the Winter Night trilogy, The Bear and the Nightingale, you know, and I love that trilogy. You will probably be surprised that The Winter of the Witch I did read in 2019. It did not make my favorites list and it wasn't an honorable mention. I liked it, but it wasn't on par for me with a lot of these other works. This, however, put Catherine Arden onto my all-time favorite authors list because I can like her adult fantasy and her middle grade horror. She just does something right for me as an author. I already said that this is kind of horror, but it also has this mystery element that's really fun. And I found this book thoroughly creepy. I also read Dead Voices this year, which is the follow-up to this one, and was creeped out by that one as well, but not as much as this. This has creepy farms and scarecrows and stuff, and I read it in October, and I was just, ooh, no, do not like scary scarecrows, not a fan. <laughs> this follows a girl named Ollie, though, who has experienced a loss recently, and she is really having a hard time in school and with friends and with her dad because of the loss that she has recently experienced and I thought that was examined really nicely just kind of like tied in to how a child experiences grief. I really enjoyed that. But with all of that happening she comes across this book that this woman is holding by a river at some point. The woman is trying to chuck this book in the river and Ollie is a little book nerd and she's like you, you can't do that, what are you doing? And takes the book and starts reading it and sees all of these things that happened in the past that were kind of creepy and then realizes she thinks it might relate to some stuff that happened in her town. And then she goes to a, on a field trip to a place that she thinks actually kind of resembles what she's seeing in this book. And it just kind of goes from there. Ollie makes a couple of friends throughout this that I just love as well. I loved seeing the friendships develop and again that examination of grief is something that I so enjoy seeing when it's well done in a book. When I do my least favorites video, you'll see my least favorite book of the year examined grief. And I didn't like it, but that's because I did not like the way it was done. So, but this one I can't recommend highly enough. If you know kids who would like the kind of creepy stuff, I would recommend this. I would recommend it for adults too. Especially adults who don't read adult horror because I am a chicken. Obviously, since middle grade horror creeped me out thoroughly. <laughs> and then my final middle grade favorite from 2019 was Wondersmith, The Calling of Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend, which I loved so much more than Nevermore by Jessica Townsend, which is funny because I did love Nevermore. I don't mean to say that like it wasn't a favorite for me, 
but Wondersmith I just thought took it to this next level because we are seeing the results of what happened in the first book, Nevermore, and how Morrigan is taking it. I really enjoy Nevermore and the Wondrous Society as a kind of setting and the whimsy that's present in this world. Like I said, I needed <laughs> that whimsy in 2019. 2019 was a very hard year. And I think that Wondersmith did a particularly good job at examining what it means to have the courage to understand yourself and to not just be yourself, but to understand yourself and accept yourself and realize that there are positive and negative light and dark in everybody and what that means for you as a person and what you're going to do about it. I don't know. And then deciding who it is you're going to be despite the aspects of yourself. I thought Wondersmith did a very good job of that because I think the having the courage to be who you are is a theme that's often examined particularly in middle grade and YA but having the courage to come to understand yourself I feel like is a bit different. Yes often you have to understand yourself to act like who you are to be who you are but I feel like that's almost the quieter part that happens beforehand before you are doing the acting and things like that that often goes unacknowledged, or even that like self-discovery in the quiet way that isn't this like external you see it, but just coming to understand yourself can be difficult, particularly when there are things about yourself that maybe you aren't a huge fan of, or maybe they aren't widely accepted by society, or they are looked at in a way that's not favorable. Coming to understand yourself can be hard, and I think that Wondersmith did that in a very subtle way that I appreciated. So I'm going to transition now into contemporary. I know that Stargazing was contemporary as well as a graphic novel, as well as being middle grade, but now we'll get into the adult and YA and new adult contemporary that I enjoyed because there was one from each of those categories that made it onto this list. First up we have Chemistry by, I apologize, I did not look up the name pronunciation ahead of time, by Ki Wang, I believe is how you would say it. And this is kind of literary adult contemporary. This follows a female protagonist who is currently in graduate school. She is pursuing a PhD in chemistry. And as someone who just completed graduate school, not a PhD, but I did recently, like over the past year, receive a Master of Education and Education Specialist degrees in school counseling. So I have three years of graduate education, so this was kind of meaning a lot to me. So seeing that automatically like was ticking some boxes for me how she was talking about you must love chemistry unconditionally and I don't think that was quite how my program approached counseling just because we do have you know the focus on self-care and that you will burn yourself out as a counselor if you just do this if you love this unconditionally without caring for yourself I did see some people who were burning themselves out and I wasn't always challenged within academia. So that was something I kind of appreciated. Um, but on top of this, she has Chinese parents who have these particular expectations of her and how she will perform and succeed and what her life should look like. And there's just a lot of dissonance with that, with her coming to terms with I, I, if I'm not doing well in this right now, I don't know what I'm doing, period. I don't know who I am, or what I should do, or anything. And this is a very, like, internal monologue style of writing. You're basically, it's almost stream of consciousness. The way she is just, like, stating her thoughts, and sometimes they jump all over the place, and sometimes there are just little segments that are about one specific thing, and then it'll move on to the next thing, which I was surprised that didn't bother me. I think that would obviously bother me a lot more in fantasy, but for this contemporary that's almost literary, I appreciated it. I also thought it was interesting to see this kind of cultural dissonance with her boyfriend Eric, who is just this like traditional American guy and his traditional expectations versus her trying to figure out what is my life going to be, especially if it ends up not being getting my PhD in chemistry. What am I going to do? And this idea of, well, I can't just get married to you and that's going to be my, I need to be, I don't know what I want, I don't know what to do. This is not going to work for everybody, but it did work for me and I'm so glad that I read it. The narrator, I don't even know if we 
know her name. I don't remember learning her name. It might have been said casually in passing in conversation, but because we're reading from her perspective in first person, and it's not in any of the descriptions that I've seen, we might not even know her name. <laughs> she is so funny. I think part of that comes from that first person, like, stream of consciousness perspective, but she cracked me up. <laughs> a lot. Which, again, that's probably my particular sense of humor since a lot of things I don't find funny that a lot of people find funny. So I don't know what the common audience would think of this, but if it appeals to you based off of what I've said, maybe look at a snippet of a writing sample from it or like quotes or a, a sample on Amazon or something. I don't know. Check it out from your library, do something, but I think it's worth a shot if it appeals to you in any way. Then we have a new adult contemporary romance, which was Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McKeeston. McKeeston? McKeeston? I don't recall. I apologize. This is super hyped, so I'm not even going to really describe it. And honestly, it's adorable, but it's ridiculous at the same time. It was, <laughs> it was dramatic and crazy and... I don't know, it was what I needed to read at the time. I just thoroughly enjoyed reading it. Do I think it's objectively the best thing I've ever read? Absolutely not. <laughs> Honestly, it's probably a bit overhyped. But I just really enjoyed it. The male-male relationship that develops that is kind of enemies to lovers is just so cute. And there's a particular quote from that book that I love, that I feel like really delves into the emotional impact of childhood trauma and really adverse childhood experiences like as a whole. That is one of my areas of interest as a counselor. So seeing something that talked about, okay, but you basically have had the floor ripped out from under you from a very young age, so when your feelings go down, they go down. I just thought was excellent. Anyway, if you want to read a cute male-male romance with protagonists who are in their 20s that gets a bit steamy. Go for that, because it's adorable. <laughs> and exaggerated and ridiculous, but still super cute. And then speaking of male-male romances, I read Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda for the first time in 2019. I actually read it twice, because I read it once myself. At first I wasn't super into it, and then by 100 pages reading the emails, I was hooked and then I read it a second time because I read it out loud to David. This is another one that is very hyped, and it's cute, and I'm not going to say too much because everybody knows about it at this point, but I really loved these characters. I don't know, I often don't get that emotionally attached to the characters, maybe it's more the writing or something. I loved Simon as a protagonist. He was a sweet boy, <laughs> and I shipped it. Oh, it was so cute. The emails are precious. And now we get into the section that you have probably been expecting this entire time, like what you probably thought the majority of this video would be, and it kind of is, because 10 of my top 19 are SFF. Well, SFF that's not middle grade or graphic work, because if I was including those, it would be more than 10. <laughs> but I thought that this would be a good way to kind of divide. So we'll start with the science fiction that I read that made my top 19 of the year. First is Kindred by Octavia Butler. This is kind of a crossover between historical fiction and science fiction because it takes place in the 70s. We're following Dana, who is a black woman of that time, and honestly, like, that part is not what I'm referencing as historical fiction because for when this was written, that wasn't really historical. But she has this thing that happens to her where she goes back in time and rescues a white boy in, I believe it's the 1800s, and that white boy was one of her ancestors. So that is where it becomes historical fiction and science fiction because she is time traveling back, and we spend long periods of this book in the antebellum south with her interacting with Rufus, one of her ancestors, who doesn't know very much about her and is confused by her, and they have this interesting relationship and this dynamic, and I think that Butler does this good job of examining slavery in a way that's very multifaceted, because I think that slavery is bad and awful, but like seeing the relationships and dynamics that some of the people had, where it's like confusing because you loathe them, but at the same time there are these moments where you have feelings of connection. and. No, I don't think that slavery was good for anyone. I mean, obviously it benefited the people who were profiting off of it, but seeing 
this kind of, I don't know, in-depth view was just really, really interesting. And this is what made me want to read more of Butler. I mean, I have read her Earthseed duology and I enjoyed that, but this is what really caught my attention and made me think, ooh, I was hooked with this. I wanted to know what was gonna happen. Then we have the third book in the Wayfarer series, which is Record of a Spaceborn View by Becky Chambers. As of right now, there aren't planned continuations for the Wayfarer series, but I really hope that she'll get to it because this universe is something I've just fallen in love with. The first book in this series in like the chronological order of events is The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, which a lot of people really love and that follows a specific crew. All of this really takes place in space, um, but it's all within the same universe, even though we might see like different planets, different systems, different societies. So they have a common history in a sense. And then this book is following the Exodus fleet, which is the human fleet that left Earth a long time ago and live not on a planet anymore, but on this particular fleet, like this set of spaceships kind of thing. So you see a lot of perspectives within this community and some that are external to the community but that are entering the community, people who are considering leaving the community. And what I particularly enjoyed about this, in addition to Chamber's writing and her characters and everything like that, is the themes regarding life and death. They are particularly explored in this book because there are death practices within this society. And as someone who, again, death and grief are themes that I just really like to see, which makes me seem like a morbid person. But I just thought those were very interestingly done. I think there are around six perspectives, which is something that a lot of people didn't like, but I personally had no issue with it because I felt pretty compelled to read all of the perspectives. And the way that Chambers is just casually diverse is something I really appreciate. She's an author who just really resonates with me. Then we have two science fiction short works which made my top 19. The first one is The Test by Sylvain Nouvelle, which is very short. It's only about 100 pages, so I can't say a whole lot. But basically, this is a dystopian Britain where to become a citizen, to enter as an immigrant and become a citizen, there is a particular test that you have to take. Um, there are 25 questions on this test, and I won't say anything more really about it because anything beyond that is kind of a spoiler because if you don't know what's coming, like I didn't know what was coming, you are just shocked. I devoured this. It's only 100 pages again, but I was just like on the edge of my seat once I realized what was happening and it freaked me out. <laughs> this should be a Black Mirror episode. I don't even like Black Mirror that much because it always makes me like a little uncomfortable, which I realize is the point. But this really should be a Black Mirror episode. The way that it looks at the immigration experience from the people who are receiving the immigrant as well as from the people who are trying to leave their previous country and come over to a different country and then the trauma that can be associated with that and the decision to have that experience anyway despite the trauma or to persist with the experience despite... Whew, this is a hard one though, enter with caution, <laughs> but one of the best things I think I read in 2019. And I really hope this is not the future because it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Then the other short work that was science fiction is going to come as no surprise given how much I was gushing about loving this author. That was To Be Taught If Fortunate, which again, short work, can't say a whole lot. This follows a crew of four particular people. It's not part of the Wayfarers, but it is still like a space opera because they are exploring the universe specific places they have mapped out that they're going to. And they do something called soma forming. So rather than forcing the environment to meet their own biological needs for them to be able to function there, they are changing their bodies to function within the different environments that they are exploring. And that was an interesting concept to me. This is like a soft and quiet book and it has this awe as this kind of like common emotion as they're experiencing these other settings, as they are discovering new places, new things, that I just, oh, 
it makes me want to be like a space explorer, but I'm not gonna do that, obviously. <laughs> but if I feel that way, seeing new places and things on Earth, like, it's just kind of this magnified feeling of awe and wonder of what you're seeing, which I just really like. The joy of discovery and some ethical questions. I love Becky Chambers. All right, we made it. Now we just have to do the fantasy and there are six of them. The first one is gonna be Circe by Madeline Miller. I think it might actually technically be Circe. I'm not positive. Everybody says Circe though. Madeline Miller's style is excellent. It is beautiful and lyrical and there's this quietness to it that I appreciate, particularly with this where we are looking at Circe who is this witch who goes to an island, she is like sentenced there basically, and it kind of is exploring her life, again, very quietly and slowly, and her experience as a woman and as a kind of god, and humanity, mortality, all of those are kind of looked at in here. The themes regarding womanhood in particular though, I just loved. Loved a lot. Again, another book that I don't think everybody's gonna love. This is not plot driven at all. This is wholly character driven. So if you can't do that, you probably won't like this. You might like The Song of Achilles a bit more, but again, it's another one that's like character driven. So Madeline Miller seems to excel at that though, doing character driven works. Then we have one that you will be unsurprised to see on this list and you were probably expecting if you've watched my channel for any length of time that this book would be on here, this and a couple others. You will see two of the trilogy that you're probably thinking of. <laughs> and that is Fool's Assassin, which is the first book in the Fits and the Fool trilogy, which is the final and fifth series within the realm of the Elderlings. You can't say very much about this without spoiling the events of previous trilogies, so I can't say very much about it, but you are seeing Fitzchivalry Farseer, who has been the protagonist for three of the trilogies of those five in the realm of the Elderlings. You are seeing him in different roles in this book as compared to what you've seen from him in the past. And this book in particular within the trilogy is just wholly different from anything else I feel like was done in the Realm of the Elderlings. This is slow and quiet and if you've read the Realm of the Elderlings you're probably like, it's more slow and quiet than the others? <laughs> really? Yes, this is just like everyday life for Fitz in a particular setting, which again, can't say anything about, but it was very interesting. And then this book actually introduces a second perspective within the Fitz books. You know if you have read any of these series that the Live Ship Traders and the Rainwild Chronicles are both multiple perspectives, but when we read the Farseer trilogy, the Tawny Man trilogy, those, the Fitz books, are single perspective. They are just Fitz's perspective. When you get to Fitz and the Fool, a second perspective is introduced and it is a new character. And I loved that perspective. <laughs> I enjoyed that perspective very, very much. Not everybody did, but I did. I, I adore it. <laughs> so this book was different and I didn't know what to expect going into this. And then it's very slow up until we get to the very end and whew, takes off. <laughs> There's just a lot of like examination of his life that happens here and seeing him as not a different person but in different roles and I loved it. And then obviously we have Assassin's Fate which is the third book in the Fits and the Fool trilogy and the last book that has been planned for the Realm of the Elderlings which is heartbreaking for me to be honest. You might be surprised Fool's Quest was one of the honorable mentions, but did not make it into this list. Assassin's Fate is the culmination of this 16 book series, like this is the 16th book, and it ties together so many things from the different series, particularly within the Fitz books, but there are Live Ship and Rainwell try-ins as well. Seeing everything come together was insane, and then the ending was just 
it was a lot. I reread parts of the ending to myself the other day just because I like to make myself feel emotional, apparently. <laughs> I know that some people felt mixed about the ending of Assassin's Fate, but I think that this book ended the only way that this series really could. I cannot picture this like overall series ending differently than it did. Maybe different things about how it was written and some perspective things I can see being done and I would have personally enjoyed, but the ultimate ending is what I think it needed to be. And that's all I think you can really ask of Robin Hobb after she's written 16 books in this world. This work, as in this 16 book work, is really, in my opinion, a masterpiece. And Robin Hobb is the master of character. I think that she is currently writing some urban fantasy and may write again in Realm of the Elderlings in the future, featuring a perspective that we've seen that has never been the main perspective, and I would like that a lot. You should pick up the Farseer trilogy. Or if you are already reading The Realm of the Elderlings, you should continue on with whatever comes next for you wherever you are in the series, because it is well worth it. Then we have In an Absent Dream by Shauna McGuire, which is the fifth book in the Wayward Children series. This series that starts with Every Heart a Doorway is portal fantasy, and it's very popular, so if you follow fantasy and short works and everything, you probably are already familiar with this. This is a prequel story. This happens before the events of Every Heart a Doorway. Long before, actually, because it features an adult from Every Heart a Doorway in their portal world as a child. In this, we are following a character named Catherine Lundy, who goes into her portal world to the Goblin Market. Catherine Lundy is this very serious, quiet, studious young girl who's a bit lonely in ways, and she goes to the Goblin Market where fair value is such a large concept. You have to do what is fair and what is right, and that doesn't necessarily take into account your individual perspective. It looks at the collective as a whole. And I resonated with this so hard. <laughs> I think that if I had, you know, the portal fantasy worlds like in this where it suits the kind of person that you are, <laughs> the Goblin Market might have been where I would wind up because that concept of fair value just made a lot of sense to me and the kind of person that I am. So it might not be everybody's favorite in the Wayward Children series, but I think that there's something for everybody throughout the series just because there are so many different portal worlds and different stories that are happening. And this was mine. All right, almost done. Two left. We have The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang, which is historical fantasy that is very influenced by Asian culture and history. I think in particular Chinese and Japanese culture and history. There is a particular war that I think the author drew inspiration from that I am blanking on the name of right now, but I did quite a bit of research into it immediately after finishing this book because I was so captivated by what had happened. This book examines like the horrors of war and some of the kinds of things that have actually been done and our real experiences so well. It's brutal, it's not like glorifying it in any way, it's saying this is like how it was, this is something that happened, while at the same time pulling on these unique interesting fantasy ideas like the shamanism that I found really interesting as someone who likes to see magic but seeing that tied in with different kind of cultural backgrounds as opposed to this very often like medieval Europe kind of setting that we get. And I found the story just engrossing for all of those reasons. I was interested in it from the historical kind of perspective, I was interested in it for the magic and world and the kind of school that the protagonist is going to. I was interested in the plot from the very beginning given that we are following a girl who does not want to be married off so she studies her butt off to get into the most like competitive kind of school in their region, like in the country. <laughs> and then everything that happens and the competition that goes on within that kind of school or program afterward, I was into that as well. But this book is brutal, so again, approach with caution. 
it verges on being kind of dark fantasy, even though I would say it's more historical fantasy, but the dark fantasy because of that brutality. People often say that they feel like there's a disconnect between the first half of the book and the second half of the book, and that characters suddenly start acting differently, but I thought that made a lot of sense, which I think I've said in previous wrap-ups, because if you enter a time of extreme strife or like hardship as a country, and there's trauma that is happening, there are things going on that are beyond your typical everyday life, people are gonna act differently. You're not gonna be the exact same person. So I didn't find that confusing or anything at all. I had no issue with it. I really need to pick up the second book, but for some reason it just hasn't happened yet. All right, finally, my last book from the top 19 of 2019 is The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Another book that took a lot of cultural influences from a lot of different cultures. I think the author said that she took from like over 10 cultures she was integrating things from, which made sense given the cultural differences at different parts of the world in the Priory of the Orange Tree. And I think that that lent itself well to the world building because the world felt very vivid to me. I felt like I could picture it very well, even though there are pretty significant differences between areas of the world. I still felt like it was fully like, fleshed out and realized. I like it when worlds feel like they have a rich culture, and when it's not just one culture in the entire book, but you're seeing differences of culture. That's something that I particularly enjoy in The Wheel of Time, as an example. It feels like those like nuances are pretty well developed and I thought that was the case for the Priory of the Orange Tree as well. If it had been a series I think it would have been like outstanding <laughs> just because I think you could have delved into it a little bit deeper but for it to have been a standalone book of like 800 pages as a fantasy I thought she did a very good job. I also like to see things with religion in books, that's like one of the things that appeals to me a lot. So seeing how Sabra and Barathnet, who is not one of our point of view characters, but who is very significant because she is a ruler in the very far north part of this world, seeing how her country's religion related to her as a person, and then some of the evolution of that throughout the book. I really enjoyed. There are four primary perspectives who are in different parts of the world at the start of the book. We have two different continents that are so kind of divided by the ocean, and then there's an island to the far north of the western continent, and seeing how the different countries have their own different like religious take, even on common events, like that reminded me of the fact that there are branches of religion that had maybe some of the same like similar common things like let's say Judaism, Islam, and Christianity had like some similar roots but then diverge. It was the same kind of thing I felt like happening throughout this book that you see different perspectives played out and I enjoyed that. And then there's a particular slow burn romance that is female female that I thought was so good. <laughs> I called it, I felt it, I was like, ooh, this is chemistry, <laughs> right here. And I was waiting for it, and I don't want to say very much other than that, because it was just very good. I liked it. I also like slow burn, though, because I am not somebody who's into the instant love and everything like that. I like that kind of building connection. This book had a lot of positives for me, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. All right, I have been filming for a very long time, but I guess I talked about 19 different books, and they were books that I loved, so obviously I had quite a bit to say about them. I hope that you will check out all of these. If they are series continuations, I hope you will look at the original stuff or the beginning of that line of series, because I love all of these things. <laughs> Comment down below and let me know if you read any of these in 2019 or if you've read any of them in general and what you thought of them. Also, maybe what were like one or two of your favorite 2019 reads. I'm working my way through all of the, the videos that are in my watch later, but there are a lot of them, so it might be a while before I get to your favorite video of 2019 if you film videos. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you have a good day. And until next time, 